Right, but you mentioned uh, briefly earlier that you're a jockey coach. Yeah. And that, that's a rewarding, rewarding job. Do you think you had the best of the game as a jockey or have things improved for riders these days? I think, I think things have definitely improved because they have, there's a lot of help out there if they need it. Um, but I, I, look, the, the jockey coaching thing for me, the, the mentoring side of it is the most important part because I've had a lot of those days where you're coming back from the races and it's that silence where you're inside your own head and you're beating yourself up. That's a horrible time for any jockey. And like, you now whatever punters say, you know, when they're watching a race and they think, oh, he should have won on that. What the fuck was he doing? You know, like all that carry on. I can tell you now, when that jockey's driving home, he's asking himself that over and over and over and over and over and over again to the point of distraction. And very often you can get it wrong where you think actually something that you did was caused the horse to get beat. Very often you watch a race cold like I can and I say, well, actually the horse wasn't good enough. It wouldn't matter what you did. And very, when you ring them and you tell them that, suddenly it's like a huge weight is lifted off their shoulders. But for us and for a lot of riders, there, was no, there wasn't that help out there. So you weren't, you weren't that person on the other end of the phone or you weren't that person who was able to just lift that weight off their shoulders. So I think the mentoring side of it is huge. Yeah, one of the things that's different now um, from what we can see from recent events is that the, the weighing room used to be where it went on and it stayed. Yeah. You had a bit of a, you mentioned beating yourself up. You had a bit of a set to with Richard Dunwoody for something that happened out on the race course. Um, did those sort of altercations happen often between jockeys? Not that often. And, you know, they were normally fairly short lived. Uh, like the trouble is, the thing with the, the Woody thing was, like, Woody, you know, did something in a race and we, we basically came back in and I basically said to him, like, what the fuck were you doing? And then he, he was blaming me. And he then, and I said something to him and then basically he threw his saddle down and just, and leapt on me. Um, and then afterwards, the stewards looked into the incident and I wasn't even called in. It was him and Carl Llewellyn and somebody else that were actually called in. So in many ways, I was right, because it was nothing to do with me. It was all, like it was him, he tried to force himself into a gap, but that's by the by. And you know what? I think back to that uh, altercation, and it was a simple, it, it was a bit of a case of with me, I don't give a fuck who you are. You know, you know I didn't want anybody to, be like that that was not but at the same time i'm not gonna back down but i feel i do you know what i still feel bad about that because i admired richard dunwoody so much and so many of us riders looked up to him because he was the best you know he set the standard and he set the standard then for ap coming behind him and for every other jockey and woody and i fell out over it and I'm still sad about that to this day because, you know, I, I was, we were all in awe of him, you know, and I just wish that there was some way that I could, you know, almost repair that because it was never the same after that. Not even now? Not even now, yeah. You know, like I see Woody and we'll say hello and, and that's it, you know, but it was, it's sad because, you know, he, he helped me when I was getting going um, and I, you know, I feel bad that it, it ended like that, really. Was being a single-minded jockey something that was quite unusual amongst jockeys? Would you sort of look after each other out of the race course? Yeah, yeah, there was, there was very much a, a, a sense of, like, brotherhood to a degree. And you kind of did look out for one another. Um, I think that's changing a little bit. Well, it's changing a lot. You know, it was... It almost was like flat racing and jump racing are kind of separate because the big difference is with jump racing, the guy that sat beside you, whether it's whoever it is, you might be ringing his girlfriend or his wife or his mother to say he's had a bad fall and how are we going to get his car home? I can remember uh, Seb Sanders got hurt one day at Chepstow on the flat. 
and you know I think they were nobody nobody knew in the sense that they weren't used to actually looking out for him because it didn't happen that much on in the flat game whereas in jump racing people get injured all the time so you've always got to wonder who's and like the valets are so on top of it as well and that's why they play a huge part in that trying to make sure that his family are notified that somebody takes his car home simple thing like who drives his car home who's then going to pick him up from the hospital that night when he can't drive home you're 200 miles away from home who brings him home like all that sort of thing that jump jockeys are looking out for each other so because of that you have that sense of brotherhood um between them all you know and it doesn't matter whether it's male or female you know they're almost like your comrades so you look out for them and that is you know i, I think that's disappearing a little bit um which in many ways makes me makes me sad because it is an elite group of people who are joined together by that sense of danger and the fact that your next ride could be your last. And we all say that, and you don't really believe it, but it could be. And there is that looking out for your fellow rider. Um, also, back in those days, was it still the days of tugging your forelock to the owner? Was ah, yeah, like you, you always tipped your cap, you know, yeah, very much part of that. But as well, there was, it's like all sports. Like in those days, you know, there was always, you know, it was much more social in the evenings. You know, was it less professional? Probably yes. You know, there wasn't the same jockeys weren't as fit as they are now. Um, does that mean that they're better jockeys? Not necessarily. You know, I think they're giving themselves the best chance now because they have the ability to identify areas that they can improve in. But, you know, you look back at, at bygone days, you know, you, you look at somebody like Richard Dunwoody, you could put Richard Dunwoody into any era and he'd have, he'd have risen to the top. Were there difficult owners, ones that asked you to do stuff you didn't want to do, that sort of thing, you know, back in the day? Were, did you have... Could you, would the trainer be upset if you said to upset an owner, for example? Oh, huge, yeah. Like you, it was funny. Like some, it's a tricky one, and that's why some trainers don't like it if they have uh, ret owners have retained riders because they're not in control of how the horse is ridden. Because you, like, if you have a retained rider, the retained rider is responsible to the person that's employing him, and then that doesn't always include the trainer. So. You know, look, a trainer likes things done a certain way, and sometimes it's, it's a way that suits them. But if you have your own retained rider, it doesn't always work. You know, and very often, you know, with Willie Mullins, like the amazing thing with Willie Mullins is, you know, apart from, um, like, Paul Townend rides everything, apart from, the, obviously, the JP-owned horses that Mark Walsh rides. You know, and, but it's, is that good or is that bad? It's the owner's prerogative. They pay the bills, so they get to choose who rides them. So in many ways, you're, I always felt I had a responsibility to the owner and the trainer, and it was an equal responsibility. And you rode for some uh, quite well-known owners. Like yeah. Like Mother, for example. Yeah, I, look, that was a, uh, an, an amazing experience. And one of, the, like, one of the best days that I ever had was, uh, it was at Ascot, um, with the Ascot Chase. I won the Reynolds Town on... Uh, back and Al, and then I won the Ascot Chase on Tuchev. And I was supposed to ride one for the Queen Mother in the last. In the bumper, it was a horse called First Love, and it was favourite. And I thought it would win, but I had a tendon on my arm that had actually got damaged. And I couldn't undo the girth on the horse. For whatever reason, something happened uh, in the race when I rode back and Al. And I couldn't undo the, the girth strap. And I thought, I can't ride the horse in the last because he's strong and I won't be able to hold him. So I said to Nicky, I said, look, I'm really sorry, but I can't ride this horse in the last. I don't think I'll be able to ride it. And he said, right, fair enough, thanks. She's here today. And next thing I got a, one of the guys, the stewards who came in said to me, look, somebody wants to see you outside. So I was like, okay. So I went out and I thought it was the doctor. Went out and it was the, it was Nicky. And he said to me that, um, he said, Her Majesty would like you to go and watch the race with her and have a drink. So I was like, oh, okay. So I obviously Cheryl got changed uh, and went up to the Royal Box. 
and there she was on her own with her butler and uh, and she said to me oh, well done she said I'm really sorry you can't ride my horse and I said so am I I said I think he'll win and she said oh well that's a shame but she said would you like to watch the race with me I said I'd love to so she said to me she said oh would you like a drink and I said I would love a drink actually and uh, and she said, oh, so she looked around and there was nothing there. But there was a bottle of champagne unopened. And she saw me looking at the champagne. She said, you'd really like some champagne, wouldn't you? And I said, ma'am, I would love some champagne. So she opened the bottle and she had a Dubonnet and red and I had champagne. And I think I must have drunk at least half the bottle myself. Um, and I had a lovely time. Like she was an amazing woman. She loved her horses and she just loved racing. We were so lucky to have her as a patron. Now, you talked about the Grand National earlier on, the race that ended your career. Yeah. Um, it's, how do you feel about the race, having it provided you one of the highlights of your career and also with rock bottom? Oh, look, the National is, I think, a race that, you know, it supersedes everything else because... When you're a jockey, people say, oh, you know, this is Mick Fitzgerald. Um, he's a Grand National winning jockey. Everybody goes, what? You won the Grand National? Whereas if you say to somebody, oh, this is such and such, he's, he's a Derby winning jockey or he's a Gold Cup winning jockey, people go, mm, so, if they know nothing about racing. Whereas the Grand National is above all that. People will always have heard of the Grand National. And that was the one thing that I noticed when I won the race was that forevermore, I'll always be Mick Fitzgerald, Grand National winning jockey. And it is, for me, it'll always have a very special part because you are part of an elite group of people who have the ability to turn heads in the sense that you've done something that most people have heard of. Not many people can say that. And we're here, lovely house in Lambourne with horses. Yeah. See always out the window. So you're obviously still very much involved yeah. with horses. Yeah. Have you sat on one since? I have not ridden a horse since I came off Lamy in the National in 2008. Um, I, ha I broke C3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. I have quite a lot of metal in me. Uh, and I was advised that it's so fixed now that um, if I have a fall, it'd probably be catastrophic. So after the experience that I had when I was lying on, at the back of the second fence and I couldn't feel anything, um, I just thought, I cannot do that again. Now, you mentioned your two sons and yeah. daughters have grown up now. Yeah. Have they shown any interest in following in your footsteps? Yeah, well, they all, they all love racing and they like going. Um, um, and they're, they're quite keen and, you know, they follow it. Um, my eldest boy doesn't ride at all. Um, my middle lad, Oscar, is a, he's very keen um, on eventing, um, loves that. And then my daughter, Lola, is very keen on that as well. So I've got two riders out of three. Um, no jockeys, though. They're too big. And you've got a, a famous retiree in your paddocks. Yes, we do, actually. Yeah, Altior. Um, yeah, and he's like, the great thing is he's doing amazingly since uh, his colic. Um, so yeah, he like he's in great form. He's actually the you drove past two pens outside. This will tell you how special Altior is. I love my lawn. Altior is now on the lawn every day. Uh, not every horse gets that sort of luxury. Trust me. So yeah, I have I've had to sacrifice my lawn for Altior. And uh, and finally. Um, is there anything you'd still like to achieve before you're in out of your position as fully retired? <laughs> uh, is there anything I'd like to achieve? Um, I'd like to I just continue. Just I really like what I do. You know, I love it. Um, and I love the jockey coaching side of that. And I'd like to carry on helping, you know, people on their way. Um, as best I can because like I say being a jockey is a tough life and it's not always about the glory of riding winners at Cheltenham or riding winners at Aintree it's a lot of time about picking yourself up off the floor and picking yourself up off you know the emotional floor that is when you get beat on horses that you probably should have won on so 
I, you know, I'd like to carry on helping as many people as I can in that, really. Brilliant. Well, on that note, Mick Fitzgerald, thank you very much. Cheers.